Metten Aaron has spent six years studying Neanderthal technology. These level wall flakes, named after the place in France where they were first found, were the Neanderthal's tool of choice. At first glance, they look rudimentary, the product more of luck than judgment. But when Aaron tried to reproduce one, he got a surprise. I find the Lavawa technology much more difficult to make than any of the modern Homo sapien technologies. It took me about 18 months to master Lavawa technology, and this was after I had been flint napping for a number of years. The fact that there seems to be a, a goal involved, they're not simply just striking flakes to get sharp cutting edge. Aaron began to realize this was no hit or miss process. He wanted to discover just how they did it. So he turned to morphometrics, a technique which analyzes the exact shapes and angles of objects. It revealed Neanderthals must have used a precise set of strikes to turn a raw flint block into a carefully shaped object known as the core. The final crucial step involves striking the core with a single precision blow. Only if aimed just right would this create the perfect flake and a remarkably versatile tool. I shaped this in such a way that the core has a gentle convexity such that the large flake that comes off has a sharp edge all around its perimeter. And that enhances the utility of this particular piece in a number of ways. Because it's uniformly thick, you can resharpen it more times than you can other types of stone flakes. We also found that the Lavawa flake is statistically more symmetrical. That means when you use it, you basically reduce torque. Um, so it actually has ergonomic properties. I can actually get a lot more force with each cut and each slice. We'll just put a little more pressure and the Lavawa flake goes right through it. And we got one big piece of gammon. That took about a minute and a half. No problem. This is an amazing tool. They were engineering their rocks to get particular products that have specific properties. They were able to discover a technique that is incredibly difficult to do. It's just a testament to how intelligent they must have been to actually invent it in the first place.
A genome is the distinctive genetic recipe for a species, made up of a specific set of chromosomes. These are responsible for the characteristics that make every species different. Within the chromosomes, genes determine whether we have two legs or four, grow feathers or fur, and every part of this unique recipe is encoded within just one molecule, DNA. The DNA molecule's intertwining strands are held together by four key chemicals, represented by letters. These bond together as pairs, always C to G and A to T. These letters are like building blocks, repeating units which spell out the genome's unique recipe. Their order is critical. Just one letter out of place within three billion pairs and the genome would be inaccurate. But it begged a billion dollar question. Did we have enough in common that we could have interbred? If Neanderthals and modern humans had interbred successfully, traces of their DNA would be found in ours. Most scientists, Pabo included, thought this highly unlikely. When different species mate, their offspring are usually infertile. I was biased against interbreeding. There's no evidence for it, so I don't think it really happened. But with the Neanderthal genome now sequenced, Pabo and his team could examine this question. The first step was to map the individual genomes of five people from different ethnic groups. Then they compared this modern DNA with Neanderthal. They focused only on small specific regions called variable areas, where the order of the DNA letters often differs from one individual to the next. Here, if interbreeding had taken place, letter sequences typical of Neanderthal DNA would show up in the human DNA strand. But with no interbreeding, there would be no trace of Neanderthal DNA in the variable areas. Pabo expected to see the same negative result in the genomes of all five modern humans, regardless of ethnic group. Well, if Neanderthals are equally distantly related to everybody, then Neanderthals should match the French guy and the West African guy equally often. But that is not what they found. When we compared one African to a European individual, the Neanderthal matched the European individual more often than the African one. The result indicated that Neanderthals were genetically closer to Europeans and Asians than they were to Africans. It meant that somewhere along the line, European and Asian humans had picked up Neanderthal DNA. So that was sort of quite shaking to me. I thought this must be a statistical fluke was not quite significant. This will surely go away when we have more data. So Pabo told his team to do the work again, and again, and again. We really needed to make it absolutely sure that we were right. We started to look at the problem from different angles. And every time we would ask the question in a little bit different way, the answer would come back, it's Neanderthal. We were able to convince one another and eventually the world that we have a little bit of Neanderthal ancestry in, in modern human genomes. The amount of Neanderthal DNA in these modern genomes is small, between just 1 and 4%. But the implications are staggering. After migrating out of Africa, early humans must have mated with Neanderthals and produced fertile offspring who inherited segments of Neanderthal DNA. 
What we have shown clearly is that we could interbreed with them, we could have fertile children, and at least some of these children became incorporated in the human community and reproduced and contributed to present-day humans. Pabo's groundbreaking research forces a radical shift in perspective regarding Neanderthals. They were genetically close enough to have children with our species. They probably also had language. And there are yet more revelations. As archaeologists re-examine previously discounted evidence in favor of Neanderthals' skills and abilities. The story of the Neanderthals is a murder mystery. They were there and now they're gone. And they go away at about the same time as we are showing up on the scene. So why did they vanish while we survived? For years, many scientists believed we wiped them out. A simple case of our brain outclassing their brawn. This is a flint spearhead. At its base, a large sticky black mass, most likely used as a glue. Evidence from many sites had already shown how Neanderthals attach stone flakes to wooden shafts, first binding them with sinew or leather, then securing the binding with a glue-like substance. This turned the flake and its shaft into a robust weapon. It is um, a material that they used in probably in, in, in many aspects of everyday life. Uh, get this battery, um, At first, it was thought this Neanderthal glue was, was nothing more than sap from a pine tree, easy for them to find and use. Here, 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 here. But detailed analysis revealed something different. It was a type of man-made pitch from birch trees. The chemical studies have shown that that material was produced from uh, heating birch bark. Neanderthals were producing these pitches. So it is not something like the stuff that, that you can retrieve from a pine when you, when you, when you hit a tree and that's the, the, the natural stuff that comes out. This is the world's oldest known synthetic material. It makes Neanderthals, and not us, the inventors of perhaps the first industrial process. But how could an allegedly primitive species have done this? They will try to replicate the Neanderthal technique of pitch extraction, a complex process called dry distillation. Crucially, they'll use only materials available to Neanderthals 250,000 years ago. An upturned animal skull to catch the pitch. A small stone on which the pitch would condense. Some rolls of birch bark, the source of the pitch. And a layer of ash to exclude oxygen and prevent the bark from burning. Robrooks and Palmer need to heat the bark to 400 degrees centigrade. Any less, and it won't produce pitch. Any more, and it will simply burn.
After eight hours, any pitch should have condensed on the stone within the skull.
pockets creased and tattered hang the rags of your hopes the daybreak is your midnight the colors have all died disturbing Numbered 10 to 1 by modern humans, Neanderthals weren't hunted to extinction by a supposedly superior species. They were bred out, genetically swamped. <laughs> 